Perfect. Thank you, Pranoy. All right. So good morning, everyone. And thank you for coming to our department series. Uh, it is organized between the CEA and CIMA department. So it is really my great pleasure to introduce to you today our invited speaker uh, is Dr. House, Dr. Brian House, who comes to us from Rasmus. Uh, Dr. House is the chair of the Ocean Sciences Department at Rasmus, and he's the founding director of the Sustain Laboratory which if I'm not mistaken, it stands for uh, search, structure, atmosphere interaction. So it's a very giant pool that does very cool things. Um, he's an incredibly accomplished scholar and has done really remarkable work uh, in the fields of coastal hydrodynamic processes, wave dynamics, uh, air sea interactions. And I believe currently his research is still focusing on experimentally looking at these systems with some emphasis on applications to coastal resilience, climate and hurricane modeling. Uh, and today he's gonna tell us uh, about how we can uh, you know, use this uh, lab, these experimental techniques, that expertise that people at Rasmus has developed to maybe advance some engineering applications. Um, so with that, I you know, welcome uh, Join me in welcoming Dr. House to the seminar, and thank you, Dr. House, for being here, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luis. It's a, a pleasure to be here um, and uh, look forward to, to speaking in this series. I should mention that I'm also, I have a, a, a secondary appointment in uh, the College of Engineering and Civil uh, CAE, so that's, uh, it's nice to be able to have the opportunity to present to this this audience and to um, I hope that we can help to communicate some of the opportunities that are available to do work here and the exciting time as I was just talking with Dr. Nanny before this about how uh, the, the work is progressing in collaboration with the College of Engineering now in, in an accelerating way and it's uh, particularly good timing to be presenting this seminar. So oops this um, any uh, work like this, I showing the slide now just uh, so you can get, if somebody leaves before the end, they'll understand that this is a extremely collaborative effort that requires with diverse funding and a lot of diverse con contributors and of course the students and staff that really do uh, more and more of the work are, are all the work. And I, when I say more and more, I'm talking about my own, uh, you know, I, I end up just uh, doing more of the oversight and I'm not say getting my hands dirty by the year, but uh, without the great people working with me, that wouldn't work. Um, so we have a website that if anybody wants to go look at, we just as of this week have, have an, an Instagram site as well, or Instagram page, uh, page, whatever you call it on Instagram. Um, and so that's something that you should be looking for as well coming up. I'm gonna to talk today about uh, sustained applications for engineering studies primarily. And um, this is the outline, some of the areas we'll be talking about, kind of do some basics on what the uh, facility is capable of, and then how we apply that to, to engineering type work or physical oceanography type work, uh, which is important uh, for um, the first question most engineers will ask when, when discussing something about the facility is, you know, how do you scale the results? And then we'll uh, go over some of the applications that we're currently involved in. Um, so the specs, this is the facility. Uh, it is a 23 meter by, long by six meter wide by two meter high wind wave facility. So it's got half roughly air and half water when it's full and running. And uh, the scale of facility is, is quite unique. It's the largest in the world where you have this kind of high speed wind over waves. There's, there's, large, there's, there's always been large, um, there's large wave basins. Uh, Texas A&M has one, the Navy has a large wave basin where a lot of uh, ocean engineering type work or maybe ship design and, and, or coastal erosion work at the field research facility in um, Vicksburg for the Corps of Engineers, for example. There's, so there's, there's large wave basins and there's been a number of large wind tunnels, of course, that are, that are built as well to study aerodynamics and things like that. But to marry the two, we were the first to really go beyond sort of a nominal scale, maybe a one meter 
square type facility and have gone be well beyond any of the, the wind speeds that had been previously achieved. And so um, one of the, to do this uh, and is something that engineering, College of Engineering was involved of from, from the beginning. And I, I like to remind people of that just so that you, you all can have some, feel some ownership of this too is this is an example of the work on the right was work that was done with the, the CFD work that was done since we were building something that there were no um, previous examples of, then we, you know, we had to kind of go beyond what we knew. We had uh, CFD work done by Gecheng Za and Daniel Espinal to understand, could we, you know, what did we have to do with our duct designs and all that to achieve this wind speed? And, and what, how big did the fan have to be to get a wind speed of category five, which was our goal. And, um, and Dr. Nanny's here on the call. He was uh, one of the PIs of the proposal that allowed us to get this money uh, that was supported this supported with a $15 million grant to, to build this facility. And so the, the, the key things that we had to do was understand how to achieve the wind speed we want, which was 150 miles an hour, 155 miles an hour inside the tank, a real wind in the tank. And to do that in a way that would fit in the space that we provide, had provided and not just be totally out of control with a lot of uh, turbulence and, and things that we couldn't explain based on the interaction of the wind, the wind with the water. And um, we wanted to use seawater in this or have the capability to use seawater for reasons that uh, are more related to uh, some of the work we do on air sea interaction for which the seawater is important. But this is the basic design. One of the critical things, one of, the only other thing I'll mention here before I get, you know, slow myself down too much going into the details is that we have a 12 element directional wave, 12 paddles to generate waves in, in the front end of the tank where the wind comes in. And this is really important for the scaling, which I'll discuss next, to be able to apply these, the, the things we're learning to natural conditions. And by the way, if anybody has a question, uh, I'd happy to address them as we go. We don't necessarily have to wait to the end. Uh, I, I, mean, I don't think that that'll cause us too much uh, problem. So I'm happy to address questions as we go. Um, so here's an example of the, of the tank and light winds. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, as you might see this just in any kind of day like today with some light winds blowing over the bay, but it's rare to be able to see this in kind of an in, in, in a facility in this kind of scale. This is looking from uh, to the left is where the wind's coming in, and that's where our wave maker is. And here in this picture, you can see there's a flap going over that covers where the top of the wave maker is, and that's to try to bring the airflow in at as smooth as possible without a big separation zone at the front. And then as you go to the right, you have the what we call the beach, which is primarily there to dissipate wave energy, but also serves as a mounting platform for sensors sensors and, and models. Okay, now this one is, a that was the light winds, that was the thing. And then this is a case where we have the, um, a, a, the mechanical wave. So that was just wind only, right? So that just looked like a rough, a rippled surface from a initial a beginning wind. But when we can go with really high winds and then with larger waves coming in with the paddle, which give the wind something to push at. So we could have 150 mile an hour winds, but if we don't have these paddle waves, the wa waves are going to be starting from nothing on the left-hand side, and they're not going to grow very big. And I left the sound on in this one so you can appreciate a bit of the noise, you know, because sometimes one of the cool things about the facility, I mean, it's, it's a muscular thing. It's got a lot of sound to it and, and things, so you really feel the vibrations and you feel the, the noise. Um, it was just at a, just had a, was, was on a cruise where the Blue Angels went straight over store overhead you know that feeling of the the roar in your uh in your bones but anyway well oh no i gave this let me get the sound out here well anyway i hype the sound and then i don't hear it there we go Brian, we cannot hear you. There is oh. a way in Zoom that you have to share the audio. 
but okay. uh, if you don't want to waste time, that's okay. Yeah, that's all right. But anyway, there's the. You couldn't hear the music, or you couldn't see the movie. No, we see the movie, but we don't hear the sound because you don't share the computer audio. But that's okay. Don't worry. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, you'll have to come out to hear the sound. I mean, that was a, just a teaser then. Okay. So as I mentioned, all of this would be fine, and you know, it'd be a cool facility to look at stuff. But if we can't apply it to the real world, then there's no real point in doing too much in the tank, right? So what we're doing here is, so what I wanted to do is, is kind of go through this a little bit, just so for this audience in particular, because I know that that's one thing you're concerned about. So the, the trick to here, the, or the key thing here is we have multiple different scales and different flu, two different fluids that are involved, two different boundary layers in the air and the water. We have the wavy interface, all these things. And then, this, and then if you're testing structures or instruments and things, then you have this, these physical scales of the, the thing you're trying to test. So you have a lot of different scales involved and you can't always match all of them. You have to try to understand what the key things you are that you want to match. Now, I made the point of when I talked about the fan that we could do a wind speed um, in the tank of up to 150 miles an hour. So that, or, or 62 meters a second, just over category five. Now, the reason I made that distinction is that um, quite often when we are reporting our wind speed, we're interested not so much in the wind speed in the tank. People don't care about that. If I'm writing a paper, or one of the students is writing a paper about what we're seeing, you know, people are less interested in knowing what, what's going on actually in the, you know, at the tank scale as opposed to how does this apply to the field? So they want to know, okay, well, how does that apply to U10, which is, the, the, the measurement that oceanographers use of the wind at 10 meters above the water surface. So we have different winds. We have the, un, univer, the wind center line, the, the actual observed. If you put a wind sensor there, this is what the wind sensor is going to tell you the wind is. Um, for a lot of wave work, we might want to know what the wind at a level of half the ocean wavelength is. So U lambda over two. So that's a sp specific wind relative to the waves. And here we have directional waves. We have the capability of generating waves that come at different directions to the wind. But in general, most of the time we're running waves that are you know, in the same direction as the wind. We have the wind coming in as in the direction as the waves moving, but sometimes they have angles with the waves. And that's an important parameter for a lot of wave studies and air-sea interaction studies. So when we're talking up to, to, to compare this, say, to a real hurricane, we'll want to understand a U10, uh, what it is at a 10 meter level and you usually talk about a 10 meter neutral wind which takes out the stability effects of the temperature of the sea relative temperature between the sea surface and the atmosphere and i won't go into too much detail but that's given by a standard log log wall modified for their or incorporated based on on that and and smooth atmosphere uh, measurements over roughened surfaces and you get what's called moni of similarity theory and we get a profile for the wind above the surface with this and the un measuring the stress at the surface, we can, we can then generate a, a fictional profile because obviously we don't have a wind at 10 meters and say that our wind at the, in the tank is equivalent to some 10 meter wind, which is much higher than the wind in the tank because of the log profile. So we may, even though we may generate, a, we may be looking at a 60 meter per second real wind in the tank, that may be the equivalent of a 100 meter per second wind in the field or a very intense category five. The other thing that is important for scaling is called the, is basically, the, if we didn't have these paddle waves, we would only be able to look at a real fetch. We would only be able to, to look at the, um, so you can scale the, based on the wind speed and the and the distance over which the wind is blowing you can say what your fetch is that can be a non-dimensional term so we can adjust our wind by this non-dimensional fetch i'm showing so we can adjust our wind speed to account for different um to to apply to the real world so we can have some in, in idea of what the fetch is now when we look at waves too then we can do a lot more with that because we can have waves with different uh, 
characteristics that are more like much longer ways, much more natural conditions on the open ocean. So we can really, with, with these paddle waves and the wind blowing it, we can apply our tank to all sorts of problems other than just wind blowing right off the shore. And that's really important for doing this work. And so, you know, we have our, we have our wave parameters. And so these are, they're showing the blue, these are the, the fundamental things, the, the water depth, the wave height, defined in different ways. Sometimes we can generate wave specter, we can generate mono, monochromatic waves or single period, single wavelength waves, how you report those. Um, if you have a spectral wave, you might have a significant wave height, or if you have a, just a single wave, you'd have a mean wave height or an amplitude. And then uh, the wave phase speed, the distance, the speed at which the crest of the wave is moving. These can also be non-dimensionalized. Um, we'll look at, say, the, one of the important things that's all the way down at the bottom here that we're always dealing with for coastal applications is the wave that we're dealing with, the shallow water wave. Is it, is it really feeling the bottom or is it um, a deep water wave? And that's based on the ratio of the water depth to the, to the wavelength. And um, so there's, a, and a lot of these things are tied up to the, the, what the, the other three in my green here are other different scaling parameters that relate, are, that are all related to each other, but basically they have to do with the, the, the local steepness, dA to dx is the, the you know, if you, if you put a, if you're looking at the surface and, and measuring at an instant in time and space, what is the, the slope of the surface? So eta is the, the water surface elevation, and, and that could also have a dA to dy term as well. And then we have our, if we're looking at statistically average quantities, we can have the, the significant wave height over the, the average wavelength, and that'll give you an average wave steepness. These are, have a lot of different implications. And then the other one that can be important is called the wave age. And this is closely related to the steepness because you're, you're looking at different wave ages will have different steepnesses. So a lot of these things are not independent, but, they, but there are different ways of looking at it. So the wave age has to do with the fact that the wave phase speed over the wind velocity, as the waves get longer, they, get lar they, they move faster. So they, they have a larger wave age. So when I showed the first two movies, the one coming in with the, the light ripple, you see those are characteristic of young waves. They're small, they have low phase speeds and they have, we have and if you have a large wind speed, you'll see you also have a large, a smaller wave age. Whereas when you have the longer paddle waves, they're moving faster, so you have an older wave. And this is a, these are again ways that we can compare this to case to field studies. And it's, it's important to understand these ratios of the wave phase speed to the wind speed and being able to manipulate with both the wind and the paddle waves coming in gives us the ability to do a lot with these different parameterizations, which is critical to a lot of the engineering work. Any questions before I move away from the, that kind of stuff, the wave scaling and the wind? Hi, um, this is Nina Jean Lewis. Um, I actually have more of a, a general question and this can be something we can talk about offline, but I wanted to know kind of the capabilities um, in your laboratory or just in general for modeling, like doing um, flood modeling, like what they call bathtub modeling. Um, I've seen it done, the University of, Miami, um, University of Florida has done this with um, historic structures in Cedar Key, where based off of NOAA data, they were able to model it with some GIS inputs um, and create some sort of 3D model illustrating that the rising sea levels that would impact certain heritage sites and therefore aid in the planning thereof. Are you familiar with this type of modeling at all? Yeah, we, you know, we haven't done a lot of that specifically, but we certainly have the capability to do it. In particular, when you look at forcing with, with longer waves, like we can generate low frequency oscillations in the tank so you can look at storm surge effects and, and things like that. We are some proposals then to do some complex topographies and look at how in, in different water level conditions and different wind conditions, how those might be affected by these incident conditions. So it's something that we have some capability to do. 
um, with the the lateral scale of the tank, you know, we can we can accomplish some of this at, at reasonably large scales. So it's 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 it is uh, something that we can do. It hasn't been a focus so much as yet, but that's mostly as I think I as is about you know building the people that want to use it in those ways and trying to to get people involved because I you know you can only uh, do so much as a single a group of researchers you have your own interest and, and there's other capabilities that, that need to be developed or could be developed thanks sure. not I'll, a problem thank you and then for structures and i'm you know i'm kind of uh you know i'm not not a structures guy per se i just the things that we talk about when we're trying to scale them primarily the model to prototype scale which i just mentioned and uh you know for different types of structures you're going to be able to achieve different types of scaling um, often we're in the range of say one to five, one to 10, one to 15 for different things that we're doing for a lot of the coastal resilience work, which is mostly the, 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 the biggest part of the work that we've done that's been actual structural testing. Did some things with wind and I don't recall exactly what the scale of the, or with a bridge model we did, which was pretty cool. I, I should have put a picture of that in here. Um, and I think that one might've been around one to 15 scale as well. And then you have, you have your Reynolds number for the, the turbulence. Obviously you wanna have a turbulent flow for most of what we're doing. There's very little that's, that's laminar, although we, we do have some work where we're looking at details of, of turbulence generation and things like that, where we're, we're concerned about you know, laminar flow as well. And then we have the, the fruit number, which is the way that you know, primarily with this ratio of the uh, inertial to gravitational scales that we use, that we can get a good range of and compare with um, with uh, field conditions and with the velo velocities that we can, the large velocity range we can get and with the, the reasonable depth range of, of water about zero to 0 0.80 meters, we have a chance, we can get a decent range of, of food numbers that compares well with uh, things like, uh, with studies that uh, Mohammed uh, and Landolf, uh, Dr. Barbiegos, or Barbiegos have been doing with reef studies in the, in the tank. So just to give you an idea what sort of the, the reason, the, the main, like one of the main reasons that I was pushed, pushed to build this for my own research was air, was trying to understand the coupling between the wind and the atmosphere and extreme conditions. And um, that was, uh, this is a work that we've um, recently expanded with some air sea interaction with, with NSF study that's just coming to a close now, where we're expanding on work that we did in two 2004. Mark Donilon uh, was my mentor in this air sea interaction lab work. And he, he and I and others put this paper out in 2004 that said that the the drag coefficient leveled off in high winds, which is really important for hurricane modeling and has is, is been very in influential in the field and um, has is very wide, is used in most of the hurricane forecast models. And so we wanted to expand that to the higher wind speeds you are capable of and sustain and understand different things that affect that with different directional components, the waves, the sea spray coming off of it and things like that. And so, we have um, uh, conducted a study where we're, we're looking uh, further at these conditions. And this is some of the setup we did in the smaller facility we have. We've also since taken measurements in the larger one in order to understand how the wind and the waves couple. And uh, while this is one of the things that is actually, you know, we discovered that in the earlier work, there was a slight error. So that was a concern because it is being used in operational hurricane forecast models. So that was something that we put out there um, in, two, in Kursik and House 2020 and uh, put this corrected formulation. And if you look here, the this is what the difference was in this high wind speeds in terms of the stress coupling between the atmosphere and ocean. The black was what we found in the new work and the red was our original work. So it's not, um, dramatic difference, but um, a, that's certainly a, a correction that needed to get out there. So we were able to put that out there. And also what key, what one good thing about this is aside from the fact that we've now corrected the record on it is that it agrees well with um, 
our data now agrees well with data that was collected in the field. All the sort of compendium of all the data that's been collected over decades of, of inner sea interaction studies and lower winds where there's a lot of data. See, the thing was up until we, the work in 2004 and this work, nobody had really observed anything over about 20 meters a second in the field, 20 to 25. So now we're going out to almost to 50 and um, that was into the hurricane winds and all that. So it was really important work. And the, the good thing is that if you look at the red now, which is the work we just did, we're agreeing at the low winds and, at, and, and have this behavior at the high winds of leveling off, which, which is um, something that uh, can kind of give you a universal coupling, a universal momentum coupling between the atmosphere and ocean from this very light winds all the way up to extreme hurricane conditions. This was um, in the smaller of our tanks. We're now working up the data that was gone up even higher up into say category four or five wind hurricane force winds. And these are all just wind without any waves. Any of the, you saw when I, the, the monochromatic paddle wave at the beginning, the huge, the larger dominant wave that was there can have a huge impact on the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean. And this is work that if you see it on the upper right here, you see that this um, the wind and paddle waves is dramatically higher than this, what I was showing earlier with just the wind. Now, um, just as I mentioned, a lot of the work we do here, one of the things we did was built most of the tank you saw is out of acrylic. And the main motivation for that was to take advantage, you know, this was, built and finished into around 2014, was designed in 2008, we already knew that we were gonna do a lot of imaging because imaging is really important to measuring these things, you know, these hydrodynamic processes these days. So that's why we built everything out of acrylic to give this the most flexibility for doing uh, imaging work. And this shows the, the um, oops. Oh, I see. And so, Wave development is important for this drag saturation. So just in terms of the imaging, this is just an example of looking at different oops, different uh, side imaging. We're doing some what's called a contact line, like um, imaging of the, of the illuminated water surface from the side so we could see what the form of the wave does. Something you can't really do in nature very well, but we can do it in the laboratory. And it gives us a nice way to understand what the surface is looking like, what the real surface and these kind of high winds. And the reason for this drag reduction is in fact that the, the, the waves begin higher winds start to be, the crest being torn off and you have separation and things like that. Uh, the separation of the airflow over the, the wavy water surface and that can then reduce the, the, the drag coupling between the two fluids. And that's uh, something that we're intensely involved in understanding. Um, my graduate student uh, Payson is, is uh, looking at this now and then we're working up some, some new measurements on, on what, uh, what this uh, sheltering effect is and, and how it impacts the, the momentum coupling between the surface and the waves. So these are examples of um, frequency spectrum of the water surface elevation. And uh, one of the things that happens just real quick, I don't wanna to get too deep into this, more just an example, but um, is that when you have paddle waves, the, they, they, the wind blowing over them is strongly modulated such that the paddle waves are growing and that the, the, the spectrum shape becomes dominated or very different when you just have the, these longer waves coming in. So it's affected this and this in the ocean, this is like swell waves or things. So you have longer waves present, they then have a strong impact on the momentum coupling because they, they set the scales of, of that. And then, of okay, course, again, this is about you know, one of the main applications for a lot of this is, okay, coastal structures. And here's, you know, we've seen it. This is from Hurricane Michael. It's like every year I could up, update my slide with the latest examples of uh, destruction like this in, in coastal areas. 
in the U.S. and around the world of of what uh, you know what can happen to its structures on the coastline. You know, even here, these are a lot of these were elevated, but they you know they weren't elevated in the in, in ways that were particularly well done, and so. Um, we're trying to understand how do we build better? What are the true loads and what can we do to build better? So we're not in, in the tank, primarily we're trying to understand what is, what's the loading on the structures. It's up to you guys, um, the, the structural engineers and civil engineers to, to kind of figure out how, how you do that. It's up to me, and people working with me to try to say, okay, what is it that we're actually gonna be facing in these conditions? So this is like a one to, these are some examples of uh, one to 15 scale models set in the tank, and then looking at what the, the wave, wind and wave loading on them is. And so it's combining, so there's, you know, we can understand in, in sort of like in the absence of wind and you, you know, there's some formulations that have been developed for wave impacts. There's some understanding of what wind loading is. But when you have the two acting together, which you always will in a landfalling hurricane, there's very little information available on what the combined coupled loading of those two things are. And so we've done studies of that in the tank. And uh, here's an example with the, um, with wind on this one type of structure. And then here's one with a sort of a storm surge example on a structure on grade with this uh, waves and wind hitting the structure. This is obviously lower wind, but it's not that low because you can see the spray being blown off the top of this. So this is looking at, at the, the loadings on that. Um, these are some of the earlier work we did. We've gotten a lot more sophisticated in how we do some of this now with some new instrumentation. But um, this is where we, the basic idea is looking at what, what the, the loading, the combined effect of the wind and the waves on different faces of this structure. This is like a, a one to 15 scale. So there's a record from that, that test. And as the wind was going up here, the, you had the front faces in the blue and the side face is in the, brownish red, I guess we call that color orange. And then um, it's, so you see that there's a steady increase as, as the time was increasing here, the wind was increasing. And then the, there was also these waves. So you see this spikiness is the wave loading on the structure. And then you have the, the in, sort of the steady trend of the wind. Of course, the, the structure in the front was, was much more exposed to both the wind and the waves. So you see it has a bigger increase due to the wind, the, the front face, sorry. And then the, the spikiness is also much uh, larger in that because it's getting directly hit by the wave. So you see the wave and the wind impacts. And one of the things that's related to what I was talking about at the beginning is you notice as you, so this was all the way up the intense cat five hurricane. And you see that the, as they get reached up to this sort of this threshold here, they both kind of leveled off. Like you, the, the, the rate of increase of the wind loading leveled off or was, it became less. And then the spikiness due to the waves became less. And this is related to what I was talking about before where this coupling coefficient levels off and you see this tearing and the waves don't continue to grow as much. So it, it's all, it, 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 um, combined into this, but this combined wind wave load, and you see that, you know, the spikiness, the wave impacts is a, is a big part of what happens in this, in, in this um, making the structure vulnerable during a, during a landfall and hurricane type thing. It's not just that you have this steady load, you have this, you know, every five seconds, every 10 seconds, whatever the period, you're getting slammed by this, this, this wall of water. So makes a, a huge difference when you have this type of uh, combined loading. So that's the sort of the traditional type of structure. And then um, over the last several years and with work with Dr. Rode Barviegos, um, Pranoy Suranani is also involved in, in some of this work. We have um, been looking at hybrid 
natural and engineered structures in order to reduce the energy before you hit the before you hit the, the elevated uh, home on the beach is how do we use these something to take away the energy before it, it impacts the shoreline. And um, this is something that uh, was largely motive or okay I, I thought I had to slide that in there but anyway it's it's a work that has been in collaboration with people that do studies of the economic benefits and uh, working with biologists, this is in, uh, inspired or initiated by a U-Link program that the university did where we bring dip people with different disciplines to work together. It's been an incredibly uh, energizing and fruitful collaboration doing this because you know it's, it's exciting to, to learn about how, you know, a lot of, there's so much overlaps you don't appreciate until you get in trying to do this stuff. So working with the biologists, um, you know, been learning a lot of stuff that, uh, that uh, helps you know expand where we're at with this. So the, the idea is that you know as climate increases, and we need to understand how we can help to protect the coastlines, and how what net role natural defenses can can provide in addition to to where you might need more hardened engineering solutions. Can we use these types of natural defenses such that they help the ecosystems, they're more good for recreation and things like that, and um, but also provide resilience. Resilience. And um, there's some examples, there's a lot of different things people are doing trying to get coral, you know, so coral reefs are in tremendous danger in the area or in, in great decline. And we're trying to understand how we and so people are wanting to go back and replant, re restore reefs, try to get reefs to, to come back or at least not, or maybe not go away. And so how do we, how can we do that in ways that really enhance resilience as well? That provides an economic, a, a stronger economic or direct economic evaluation of something like the uh, Corps of Engineers is used to understanding, right? So they're used to, you say, you'll protect this much value of property, by doing a reef restoration, then that's that's a big win-win. And there's a lot of interest in trying to do this type of stuff. Uh, this is the slide I was expecting. That's the, you know, this um, idea that, oh, there's hundreds of coral reefs reduced to wave energy be 97%. This is a slide that our, our rescue reef people put out based on other work that's done. Well, that's true if you have an emergent reef on a coral atoll somewhere where the you have this big swell wave just crashing on the beach, right? But most of the reefs say in South Florida, we don't have the reef right up to the water surface where the wave is breaking on it and losing all its energy. We have this kind of you know, deeper reefs that may, we may have partial reduction of the wave energy. And is that can and, and what are the characteristics of the reef and the waves in which that happens and what benefits do that provide? So that's the work that we're doing here. And um, with the idea that, you know, how much of this billions of dollars, that's what the graph is, US billions of dollars of protection can you provide by having doing some kind of activity in, in a reef in South Florida to to enhance resilience and you know over and, and that was really the idea of, of trying to get this moving forward with these hybrid structures so the thing is trying to understand we have to okay so what is the actual reduction of energy and and can we quantify that and in a way that we can put into coding to get permits for to use this to understand in, in what where we need to build for what conditions will provide protection not over promise so if somebody says well you put that hybrid reef over there out there and it didn't do anything in that category five landfalling hurricane well you know there's there's we have to be realistic in how we sell these things and what you know benefits they can actually provide this this work will help us to do that and um, this is, you know, again, Dr. Rog Barbiegos and, and Mohammed Gassin, his PhD student, our, or our PhD student, are working on trying to quantify this by looking at putting up different models and, and looking at the wave dissipation over them and understanding what different characteristics. These are some of the earlier work we've done. We have where Mohammed's been doing significant testing over the last few weeks on different coral forms and um, trying to understand how that all 
to, uh, what water levels, wave heights, what different types of corals, what different densities of corals, how what they call rugosity, which is the roughness of the reef, how all these things can affect the dissipation of the waves. And here's some, well, this is uh, putting it down. So here we're just doing something simple. This is putting corals on the bottom. So we're trying to remove the shoaling effect. So, so one of the things I like to say is, you know, if, you, if you're trying to do the dissipation, if you can get the wave to break on the reef, like what I mentioned earlier, you can get tremendous dissipation. So if you, if you can build the reef close enough to the surface, the wave will break on it, then it's clear that you will provide significant protection from wave impacts. Now, if it's a deeper reef, then, then you do not have that ability and you, and you have um, to look at, there, there may be frictional effects as well. Okay, so, and so the thing here, we put the reef, the corals on a flat surface on the bottom, trying to understand the, the frictional effects isolated from effects related to wave shoaling and breaking, the wave increasing in height as it goes over shallower water or, or, a, or a artificial reef structure. And there's an example of that in the tank again, looking at the waves. And um, this work was then published recently, 2020, with um, various quantities related to the, the, the this dissipation of wave energy over the reef and over the corals and, and with the coral contributions and all that. So from the first work that's been done that has been able to, to do this type of getting these kind of specific quantities um, in, a, in a scale that's, that's relevant to field work. And here's some of the examples of some of the tank studies, this tank measurements, we have different wave height measurements. I'm gonna show you a slide with what these came from here in a second. And you see the change in the wave energy as it, it go as in the cases of before and after the tank, or before and after the reef structure, where you see what, what happened with the, the wave conditions. So here's a view um, of a, now this isn't flat as you see, this is, uh, has a ramped up kind of, of a shape like an artificial breakwater. We have corals on it, we're measuring in front of it. These tubes on the top are all what's called ultrasonic distance meters. They're measuring the water elevation and they can sample fast enough that they can get the wave elevation. We have these current, current meters uh, set up in front and back to get weight currents. Um, they can also get wave heights and they can get something about turbulence in the water column. And then, um, from this, you can learn, and this is just a side view showing a little bit like how these are spaced to get the information before and after the tank, before and after the reef structure and see how much energy was lost as, as it went over that structure. And this is showing from the top. Um, in this case, we had that not, not going all the way across, but we we're relying on the symmetry of the situation. And the fact that, you know, over the six meter tank, the stuff in the middle was not influenced by these, the stuff that's happening out here too much. And what we were set up very similarly right now, and mohammed has been doing a whole bunch of additional work on that, but it's, um, we've gone as far as close to the edges as we can to eliminate even more of any kind of edge effects in the work. And then here's some other, uh, pictures of this for different types of wave conditions. And much closer to the surface here, you see on the left of an energetic wave moving over, over the structure. And we're, again, we're trying to look at all sorts of different things, different types of corals, different densities of corals, different, different the heights of them to see what, what effects they have. Um, so that that's, a work that um, has been ongoing for building over the last several years. And I think we have some real good opportunities to continue that type of work. And um, also working with um, this using sea hive structures, um, which uh, I think is a, a, a way to build out artificial breakers. So the last sub section I'm gonna talk about right here and is that um, you know, we can use a lot, do a lot of instrument development and testing in the facility. One of the examples of that was um, 
the CARTH program. Now, CARTH was a large program we had that came out of the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010. And the, the uh, BP, British Petroleum, put in like $250 million into this Gulf of Mexico research initiative to fund teams to look at pro things related to oil spill tracking and oil spill uh, effects and things like that. We we're primarily concerned with improving the forecast of where the oil is going to be. And so um, we did some really huge drifter studies. And, and part of this, if, you, if the, the thing that's labeled D here is our new drifter design, C is a classic called a code drifter, which was developed in a lot similar to work what, to what we did now in our tank. Uh, Russ Davis at Scripps in the mid 80s did a whole bunch of testing on what the characteristics of this drifter number C is. And um, we use that for our first experiment. And then we designed our new, a new drifter number D, which is biodegradable. All, this, all the plastic and stuff you see here is biodegradable and much smaller, easier to deploy and all this. So that we, but we had to do all the testing to make sure that it, it had a, a good drift characteristics. That's so the key thing with drifters is you want to be sure you un under understand perfectly well whether they're being pushed by wind, waves, or currents, and what the different percentages that are. And you don't want to have for looking at the wind, the currents, you don't want to be too affected by the waves. And there's particular design things that can make that much better than, than not. We went through extensive testing in the in both the smaller and larger wind wave facilities. Um, this is just an example from the JTEC paper that shows the, these are the current velocity profiles and what the different characteristics of the different drifters were and how they, how they responded to the currents at different levels. So this was critical to getting an idea. We put a thousand of these drifters, satellite track drifters out in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, spent a lot of money to get that out there. We want to know how they're drifting and that the data we're getting back realistically models that. So, and then we're doing a lot with imaging technology as well. We are, um, with whether it's polar metric imaging, which is re related to the polarization, the reflective light off the surface on the left. This is a paper from Nathan Loxog um, in JTEC showing the process we're doing to derive current profiles and wave information from polar metric imaging. Um, that's works being continued by Han Jing Dai, looking at oiled surfaces. Uh, we're doing a lot with infrared imaging, and uh, on, the, on the right, doing type of different types of shadow graphy, particularly for. Well, I showed some for waves, and then we're doing a lot for sea spray, which is important to this whole question of the air sea momentum coupling. So, a lot, because of the, the the characteristics of the tank, with a lot of this uh, acrylic and a lot of ability to generate really energetic conditions and view them with optics, different optical type or imaging technology, we're, we're involved in a lot of um, development therein. And related to the vertical profile of the currents, this is polar metric derivation of the near surface current profile. So this is measurements of the currents, and this is the, the vertical distance from the surface. And see, these are centimeters. This is unprecedented to be able to get in a wavy surface to get the currents in the, that close to the surface and important for drifting of oil, fish larvae, pollution, microplastics, all this stuff. A lot of it happens at the surface and we're able to measure for the first time um, really close to the surface. Now, if we were just doing this in the field, we, this, this work that I'm showing here, this polymetric imaging, we did both in the field and in the laboratory, but without the ability to really prove well that we are getting that close to the surface in the lab, which is what is shown here. There, you know, we couldn't have gotten that stuff in the field published because you know they're just you know it's it's these are difficult questions. Nobody's done it before, and it really helps to have the facility to be able to um, isolate processes and and show that what you're doing is capturing what you think you're capturing without all the complicating stuff in the real ocean. So. Um, I think it's a good time to stop now um, for some questions. I, uh, if you have any further questions, I put the acknowledgement slide back up there just because in case you so people could read it again. And I'm sure I missed I missed a bunch of stuff because we have a lot of things, different projects going on now. And I apologize to anybody that might be listening for which I slighted something. 
but um, yeah, there, there's, uh, and the facility is, is available. Uh, it, it was, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Nanny was instrumental in getting it built. Uh, we want to be a partnership with uh, College of Engineering. I think over the last few years with the work that uh, Landolph is doing here, we've really kind of come to the point where we wanted to be. Sometimes this stuff takes longer, it takes the right, right people, uh, right person, Landolph and, and Pernoy getting involved to, to push us forward, to do more collaborative work. And I think we're really at a, at a point where this, this is becoming a, a reality and there's, there's a bunch of pathways. If you come over here and say, hey, I want to do something, like this, we're not, a, we're, you know, it's not like we're just saying, okay, we'll have to figure out how we can work out the accounting for that or this, you know, it's all been done. So uh, exciting times and I look forward to any questions you might have.